Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. Paris Schutz has the evening off on the show tonight. I haven't seen a scene like this and, and, and there's not many things that I haven't seen before. Amanda Vinicky is live in Auburn Gresham where 15 people were shot last night. An eye for an eye makes us both blind. Plus, how city leaders and the community are responding to the mass shooting. Because everyday Chicagoans deserve to have their basic needs met. What the city council did today to help some of Chicago's hardest hit residents. Why she continues to perpetuate this lie, maybe there's an element of guilt. Cook County Sheriff says an advocate for detainees is lying about what the jail's done to curb coronavirus. Hear her response. Policing a neighborhood falls on the shoulders of local elected leadership. President Trump and Mayor Lightfoot go head to head over Chicago's violence problem. Our Spotlight Politics team weighs in. The fight for trees in Chicago. Some aldermen want an advisory board to help keep them evergreen. And a newly reopened exhibition looks at life and the life and times of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. But first, some of today's top stories. President Donald Trump is sending hundreds of federal law enforcement agents to Chicago to help fight violent crime. Trump says agents from the FBI, the Drug Enforcement Administration, Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms and other federal agencies will work in partnership with local police. Murderers and violent criminals are breaking a wide range of federal laws. We have that. It's as wide as it can be. We will find them, arrest them, and prosecute them. They will be in jail for many years to come. And we will work with local police to identify violations of state and local laws to help ensure that offenders are caught and jailed for their crimes. Attorney General William Barr says agents are also being sent to Kansas City and Albuquerque in what he called a, quote, classic crime fighting operation. In a statement, Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot's office says Trump spoke with Lightfoot briefly today and confirmed the agents will only supplement ongoing federal investigations of violent crime. We'll have more of this development with our Spotlight Politics team later in the program. Meanwhile, Illinois saw another spike in COVID-19 cases today. The Illinois Department of Public Health is reporting nearly 1,600 new confirmed cases, bringing the state's total to more than 165,000, plus 23 additional deaths for a total of more than 7,300. Illinois is reporting a slightly increased preliminary seven-day positivity rate of 3.2%. Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker is extending a statewide ban on evictions through August 22nd. First put in place in March, the moratorium has been opposed by many landlords, including several from Will and Winnebago counties, who sued the governor over the ban in June. But Pritzker says the extension is necessary as additional housing relief approved in Springfield won't be available until next month. For many people, their ability to weather this crisis hinges on their ability to keep a roof over their family's heads. It's not enough to say that we want to build a more just and equitable state on the other side of this pandemic. We have to take tangible action to get there. The extension comes as Chicago's City Council approves a measure today that would give long-term renters more notice before they could be evicted without cause. More on that with several aldermen later in the program. And Chicago's Douglas Park is on its way to getting a new name or at least an extra letter. For years, local students and residents have pushed to add an extra S to the West Side Park's name for abolitionist Frederick Douglass. Earlier this year, a resident took matters into their own hands by unofficially adding an S to the park sign. But today, the Chicago Park District Board voted to begin the official process, starting with a 45 day public comment period. The park's current namesake is Stephen Douglas with just one S, the prominent Illinois politician who owned slaves and famously ran against Abraham Lincoln for president in 1860. You can read about the students' reaction to, uh, to this news on our website. Police are pleading with witnesses for help tracking down the perpetrators of a mass shooting last night. It took place outside a funeral home in the Auburn Gresham community where mourners were grieving another recent victim of gun violence. Amanda Venicky joins us now live from Auburn Gresham. Amanda. 
Prandis, in a summer of strife, a pandemic, weekend after weekend of double-digit shootings, this incident stands out. A drive-by mass shooting of 15 victims outside a funeral. As you noted, it took place in Auburn Gresham, a short walk from where I am now. And as you can see in surveillance footage, mourners duck and run for cover as the offenders shoot from a black Malibu. Police say that that car was stolen. The shooters and driver then fled on foot. Police say they recovered 60 bullet casings in all. That people that were in the crowd who were armed had shot back. CPD leaders, CPD leaders, that is, say it's a chilling example of gang retaliation and revenge, a cycle they say needs to stop. Pastor Donovan Price last night did what he has had to do all too often since he became a victim's advocate. He stopped making dinner as soon as he heard of the situation and hurried to the scene. I haven't seen a scene like this, and, and, and there's not many things that I haven't seen before. Um, but there were people all up and down 79th Street shot. <laughs> and just like people who you would think, oh, they must have gotten glass or something like that. It's like, no, they were actually shot too. And they were shot too. And they were shot too. And, and then the people trying to explain what happened. Um, and, and so listening to them, trying to calm them down, you know, people on the side crying. And because, you know, for a person to go to a funeral and have this happen and, and almost get shot themselves because those who weren't shot were almost shot. Price says victims told him that they heard gunshots for two minutes straight. He says he did try to work to calm them, telling them to breathe, giving those who needed it water. Other anti-violence activists say this never should have happened, that members of the community had explicitly told police they were concerned that something like it, this would occur. Mothers Against Senseless Killings founder Tamar Masnasa wrote on Facebook, I told the police they were going to shoot up the funeral and they just did. Please tell me how this happened after the police had been notified that it would. Chicago Police Superintendent David Brown says they were aware that the deceased was himself a victim of a drive-by shooting and that that incident had gang affiliations. The connect the, and he says that officers were deployed to the funeral. Every gang funeral with any evidence of any kind of gang affiliation is treated similarly. Uh, squad car presence, there were two, not one, and there was a full tactical team in the area, uh, and that's how we treat everyone. So regardless of the warnings given, if we didn't even get a warning, we treat every fun funeral or wake or repast the same ways. I spoke this afternoon with the funeral director of another nearby funeral home, and he said that police do give what he calls special attention whenever the home is hosting services for someone believed to have a gang affiliation or who has been murdered or killed. He says he is thankful for the CPD for doing that. The latest word on this incident is that most of the victims are expected to recover, too, in critical condition. The community at St. Sabine where I am at now is offering a $15,000 reward, $1,000 for each of the 15 victims. Lakeisha Gray Sewell lives about eight blocks from where the shooting took place. She says it was disheartening, emotional, scary. I am shocked by 15 people being shot at a funeral, but I am also shocked that we have made it this far, that we as a people are still here, given the absolute terror that has been rained on us. It may, it's, it's no wonder that we would infold and turn and implode and turn on one another. She says that she will be talking about this tomorrow during what's become now a virtual Thursday therapy session with the young women who are part of her Girls Like Me project. But she asks, where are the resources for Englewood, for Auburn Gresham, that have been promised after so many shootings before? Resources, she says, that could help to repair the torn social fabric. Chicago can realize that everybody has a way that they can help. It's all hands on deck. And so everybody has something. God has given everybody something. 
your, your education, your talent, your gifts, realize, first of all, that you are a part of this. Just because you live in Naperville or Fox Valley or on North Shore, whatever the case may be, doesn't mean this doesn't affect you. It does affect you. I've always said that one of the things we need to do is people need to start loving somebody they've never met. That, of course, again, was Pastor Price, who says he is continuing to work with victims of this shooting. Even those that were not directly hurt may have a friend or a loved one who was or they merely witnessed it. And he says that brings with it its own form of trauma. Meanwhile, again, police are encouraging anyone with knowledge of the situation to come forward, contact the CPD in the name of justice. All of this, of course, comes as President Donald Trump is deploying additional officers, agents, resources to the city of Chicago in the name of trying to bring a halt to gun violence. And Brandis, I know we're going to have a lot more on that coming up. So with that, back to you. Thanks, Amanda. Tragically, too many Chicago communities and neighbors are personally familiar with the city's violence. Tonight, as part of WTTW's first hand initiative exploring gun violence in Chicago, we look a little deeper into efforts to curb it and heal communities, focusing tonight on Auburn Gresham. Joining us to continue this discussion are Carlos Nelson, CEO of the Greater Auburn Gresham Community Development Corporation, Reverend Michael Flager of St. Sabina Church in Auburn Gresham, and Betty Jo Swanson, president of the 79th and Carpenter Block Club and Chicago Alternative Policing Strategy Beat Facilitator for Beat 612 near where the mass shooting took place last night. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, Betty Jo, let's start with you, please. Auburn Gresham has really recently become sort of a hot spot in the city's violence, unfortunately. Um, how has last night's shooting and others this summer affected the community? It has everybody sort of on edge, to be honest with you. We've been going through a lot. We've come a long way. We've had bad times. We've had good times. We've fought and we've, we've cried. We've done everything we've had to do to try to keep a good neighborhood. But we keep running into roadblocks, but we won't give up. But it has affected us terribly with all of the shootings, all of the loss of young lives not being able to reach the young people to make them understand that we need them here, not six feet under. So it has affected the community greatly. Now, activist Tamar Manassa of Mothers Against Senseless Killings, or MASK, she says that she warned the Chicago Police Department about the potential shooting, but she says the police didn't do enough to protect the community. Um, we just took a look at these with Amanda a moment ago, but some of her Facebook posts since last night have read, Quote, I told the police they were going to shoot up the funeral, and they just did. Please tell me how this happened after the police had been notified that it would. And three kids got shot. Did I or did I not say this yesterday? Those are quotes from Tamar Manassas' Facebook page. We should also point out that Superintendent, Police Superintendent David Brown um, has said that his department had two police squad cars at the funeral yesterday, as well as a full tactical team nearby. Uh, Carlos Nelson. All of that said, did the city do enough to prevent this? Well, you know, I would answer it like this, Brandis. I mean, it's a shame that we have to talk about deploying resources uh, at a funeral. I mean, it's a shame. And I, and I would say that's the wrong way to even address this. We should really be talking about deploying resources uh, up more upstream so that, you know, these types of incidences, you know, will, will not uh, happen regularly. I mean, we've got black residents exiting our community in mass. We've got businesses that we can't, you know, we're having a difficult time recruiting to our community. Uh, I mean, because of incidences like this. I, I mean, I, I, I don't fault the, the, the city. I don't fault the police. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a full mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. failure. And we, in addition mm -hmm. to the system, as part of the system, the residents, are a part of that failure, and we all have to work harder. Father Flager, what is the cause of this violence? Uh, some might say retaliation might be the, the source of last night's, but what's the cause well, of it? Obviously, retaliation was part of last night, and I heard the police superintendent say this morning we have 117,000 um, gang members in the city. That's a piece of it, but it's only one piece of it. Um, We've seen three major stores close over the last three or four months. We we boarded up buildings, boarded up homes, high poverty, double digit unemployment before uh, um, the virus jumped up, up higher when people were laid off during the virus. 
people returning from, from incarceration um, with nothing to do, no investment, lack of food access, lack of mental health. You saw the stories all over the news yesterday. We can't even get mail delivered in places in Auburn, Gresham. So you have all this, uh, this, this abandonment to a community, nothing growing up new to see hope in the community or development. We hear words about it, but no actual actions. Um, and so people get hopeless and despairing and hurt people hurt people. Now, today, uh, Police Superintendent David Brown again, he said that much of the violence is retaliatory, as we just discussed. Here's what he said. Too many people in Chicago have been touched by gun violence. And the response too often is picking up a gun to seek vengeance. Carlos, Father Flager, either of you, what can be done to prevent this kind of violence? Well, I, I say, think, go ahead, yeah. Carlos, go ahead. No, I, I was going to say, I think Father Mike just laid it out. I mean, yeah, too many families have been impacted by gun violence, yes. And too many families have been impacted by food insecurity. And too many uh, families have been impacted by underemployment, unemployment. And too many families have been impacted by housing insecurity. Yeah, all of those things uh, result in, unfortunately, issues, traumatic issues like this. And, and the gun issue, the guns in, in America are the first line of offense and part of America's wardrobe. Now, we go over the country, churches, workplaces, spouses, uh, relationships. And so when everybody has a gun now, the first thing they do is use a gun. How do we get to be a country where guns are now that everybody thinks they need to have in order to be safe? So you take desperate situations, desperate people, and guns are the first line of offense. We really can't be surprised if violence is continuing to grow in America. We're almost out of time, but I want to I want to give Betty Jo Swanson the last word here. You know, how have the years of trauma affected residents? It's making them fearful for their lives. It's, they can't sit out on their front lawns and front porches like they love to do. They're afraid to walk to the corner to the store. They can't let their children play out on the sidewalk. So it's affecting the everyday life of regular residents and things that make a summer fun for the young people. You just can't let them out there because you never know when a shot is going to fly down a block and bullets don't know where they're going. They just go. All right. Sadly, we'll have to leave it there. My thanks to Father Michael Flager, Carlos Nelson, and Betty Jo Swanson. Thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Miranda. Up so next, happy. city council members weigh in on last night's violence and more from a busy day at City Hall. So stick around. Don't ever miss Chicago tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. A steady increase in violent crime, federal agents in Chicago, and reversing a handful of phase four reopenings all during a global pandemic. Chicago aldermen had a full plate today during their city council meeting. Joining us with their reaction are Alderman Harry Osterman of the 48th Ward, Alderman Gilbert Villegas of the 36th Ward, and Mayor Lightfoot's City Council floor leader, and 49th Ward Alderman Maria Haddon, as well as Alderman Matt Martin of the 47th Ward. Welcome back to Chicago tonight, everyone. Um, Alderman Villegas, you know, let's let's start with you, please. And let's also start with uh, this shooting in Auburn Gresham last night. We just heard my colleague Amanda Vinicky uh, talk about what more can be done to control the violence that plagues the city, especially in black and brown neighborhoods. Yeah, thank you, Brandis. Um, you know, this these, this crime that is violence that's occurring throughout the city, we cannot police our way out of this. This is decades in the making. Uh, the mayor has taken steps to uh, invest Southwest uh, in order to bring economic development uh, to the Southwest sides of the city where coincidentally the violence is occurring. And so this is something that we're not gonna police our, ourselves out of. We have to ask corporate America, we have to develop and we have to invest in these communities to ensure that there's hope. That's what's missing is hope. Alderman Osterman to you, same question. I would say that we, we have to continue to partner with neighbors and really look at community by community and trying to build trust uh, and partnership with um, residents in the police and um, just literally having them get together, talk about ways they can make their neighborhood safer, as well as coming up with solutions uh, to keep young people active, employment, uh, other programs. But I think it's, it's been a tragic summer on, on, the, on the violence side, and um, we have to do everything we can to um, 
get through the summer safely and make sure that we don't see incidents like last night. Alderman Martin, what's been your reaction to what we saw last night? I think to underscore Alderman Viegas's point is that we need to see massive investment in communities that have been starved for those investments for generations. And that as much as the city and the state are stepping up, we need a true real federal partner. And we're not seeing that in the Trump administration. The House of Representatives have done its job. But when we're talking about addressing the climate emergency, obviously addressing employment issues that we're seeing due to COVID, a real lack of affordable housing, which is a crisis throughout our community, we need the federal government to step up and that hasn't happened yet. And we're going to come back to the Trump administration in just a second. Um, but today, Police Superintendent David Brown, he also addressed uh, the issue of this violence. Here's a bit of what he had to say. There are over 117,000 gang members, 55 major gangs along with the 2500 subset factions who are all both internally in conflict with each other and in conflict with the other rival gangs. There's several hundred gang conflicts every day in Chicago. This is about gang guns and drugs. Alderwoman Haddon, uh, you know, do you have faith in Superintendent Brown that he has a strategy and a plan to bring the violence under control? I am um, still hoping to give Superintendent Brown uh, the space. You know, he's new here, he's new to the city, and he's working in an area of long-term protracted conflict. Um, let's wait and see. But I would echo my colleague uh, Alderman Villegas in that we can't police our way out of this. In the 49th Ward, we've been working with neighborhood groups, and what I hear is people need hope, but people also need relationships built from the ground up with their local representatives and their organizations, and we need to bring the investments to the community. Um, I would say um, hearing that number of gang members that they've identified does call into question where they got the number and you know, not that we're talking about it tonight, but I can't help but think about the gang database that we still need to get rid of and wondering how we see that and knowing that in the 49th Ward where we've not seeing the, the levels of the numbers of gun violence, specifically on the south and west sides, but have certainly seen a little bit of an uptick. Um, it's interpersonal conflict, and not all of it is gang-related. It's complex, it's complicated, and I think sometimes uh, in painting it as gang-related, it can be oversimplified. Now, the Trump administration said today that it's going to be surging federal law enforcement resources to Chicago. Here's what President Trump said this afternoon. Politicians running many of our nation's major cities have put the interests of criminals above the rights of law-abiding citizens. Perhaps no citizens have suffered more from the menace of violent crime than the wonderful people of Chicago. This rampage of violence shocks the conscience of our nation, and we will not stand by and watch it happen. Now, Mayor Lightfoot has said this will not be a Portland-style deployment. Um, but, Alderman Villegas, do you have any concerns that what we have seen in Portland could happen here with this uh, increase in federal agents and officers in the area? Well, you know, let's not forget this is an election season. And, you know, the president, um, again, trying to uh, highlight Chicago and the violence. Listen, we need some investments. If he, if he wants to uh, bring resources here in the form of grants and programs and workforce development, economic development, I'm all for it. But if he wants to come here and, and portray the, the same uh, uh, military tactics that he did in Portland, we're not interested. Now, if we want to get some additional, uh, additional DEA and ATF and FBI to begin to take a look at some of the, the, the organized crime and the gangs that are causing some of the violence, we can look at that. But again, I look at this, this is just politics uh, and, and Trump trying to score some, some cheap points around Chicago. Okay. Uh, I want to thank Alderman Osterman, Martin Villegas, and Alderwoman Haddon. Thank you for sticking around uh, because we're going to come back to you in just a bit uh, to discuss the new measures that passed today, including an ordinance to give long-term renters up to four months notice of eviction. But for now, we go to Carol Marine and the debate over Cook County Jail's handling of COVID-19 cases. Carol. Brandis, on Monday in Chicago tonight, Cook County Sheriff Tom Dart lashed out at one of the attorneys representing county jail detainees in a suit over the jail's response to the coronavirus and the charge that DART didn't do enough to keep detainees safe until a court ordered it. Here's some of what he had to say. She's a liar. I mean, you know, 
we can trust the Zum say, well, that's her interpretation. That's not her interpretation. That's an outright categoric lie made up, full, you know, everything. And how this person can make such bald faced lies is, is mind numbing. Is there no depth that people won't go to at times? Joining us now are Alexa Van Brunt of the MacArthur Justice Center, one of the groups representing Cook County jail detainees and the person Dart was talking about in that clip, and Robert Shannon, who's representing Dart in the suit over jail conditions. Welcome both of you to Chicago Thank tonight. You, Carol. Thank you. So, Ms. Van Brunt, what the sheriff had to say, would you like to respond? I would, Carol. And I, I just would like to say that those uh, comments just completely miss the mark of what is at stake here and what's always been at stake here. And it also misstakens the historical record. In late March, coronavirus swept through the Cook County jail like wildfire. By early April, it was the number one hotspot in the country and hundreds were sickened and there was very little testing and pretrial detainees were forced to file a lawsuit to get protections for their lives. And a court, after hearing evidence from both sides, found that the detainees were at an unreasonable risk of losing their lives because of how the jail was handling the pandemic. And the court then entered many really strong protections to protect detainees who are some of the most vulnerable people in our society generally, and especially to sickness like the coronavirus, which killed seven people in the jail and sickened hundreds more. And I also think that Sheriff Dart's comments completely uh, just missed the mark of what's still at stake, which is an, a virus that is still raging. There is no victory over COVID here and which risks hurting and perhaps even killing people in the fall as things continue to deteriorate, as even President Trump has said that they will. Mr. So I, I just want to say that his remarks uh, fail to account for the human lives and suffering that are at the heart of this case, and it should be at the heart of what he is concerned about. Mr. Shannon, did it take a court order to force the jail into action? It did not, uh, and Carol, uh, I understand, uh, understand the reason why the sheriff is upset, and, and so are we. And once again, Ms. Van Brunt, unfortunately, is being irresponsible with the things that she says. Um, she is not being truthful when she tries to take credit for the hard work and the very remarkable positive results on the infection rate that have occurred at the jail. That credit does not belong to her or to that lawsuit. That credit belongs to the hard work of Sheriff Dart, his partners at CIRMAC, uh, and all the sheriff's team members that uh, dug in and worked extraordinarily hard all the way back in January under some of the most challenging circumstances that you could imagine. And they had been dealing with that day in and day out, uh, irrespective and long before Ms. Uh, Van Brunt ever had this on her radar. Uh, Ms. Van Brunt also has claimed that the jail does not care. That is not true. And that is absolutely inconsistent with what the court has found based on actual evidence. What the court has found, and, and this is part of the public record, is that it cannot be disputed that the sheriff has undertaken significant and impressive efforts to safeguard the detainees. We know recently from the CDC that those efforts have been extraordinarily and thankfully successful. What the court also found is that he was satisfied. This also is part of the public record and inconsistent with what Ms. Van Brunt is saying. Ms. He's Van satisfied Brunt. with that good faith efforts that they had worked hard with the goal of protecting people. So it, it is offensive, but more importantly, inconsistent with the facts and evidence in the actual lawsuit for Ms. Van Brunt uh, and her colleagues to try to take credit for the planning that started in January of 2019 Ms. with a tremendous amount of foresight and partnering with experts and following science that had nothing to do with- Can I respond to that, Carol? Absolutely, you may. All right, well, I mean, first of all, this idea of credit is just very telling about where the sheriff's head is, which is not the protection of humans, but the protection of his reputation. And the court found that the sheriff was acting unconstitutionally. That is why there's a temporary restraining order. That is why there's a preliminary injunction order in this case, which required the sheriff to implement social distancing, which he had not done, to, which required the sheriff to give soap to detainees, which he had not done, which required the sheriff to distribute masks to detainees, which he had not done, which required the sheriff 
to do widespread testing, which he had not done. All of these measures were in place because the court ordered the sheriff to do them and to call me irresponsible is to ignore the plight of the many hundreds of detainees who were suffering inside the jail and are still suffering as a result of what the jail failed to do let's to protect take a look, them. Let's take a look at some photos from a court filing, which is showing the masking and social distancing that are now in place. Is this a change from what the jail was doing, or is this how it has looked prior to the court suit? Mr. Shannon. Those efforts, Carol, go all the way back into January, long before many institutions were even thinking of this. And, and you need not take my word for that, um, because you can, you can look to the CDC. The CDC is the national expert. It's the authoritative source on this. And what the CDC found, based on its expertise and an actual tour and a visit to the jail, was that the sizable drop in infection rate, that, those are its words, uh, and the, the fact that this, it had spread, uh, stemmed the spread of the infection was the result of multifaceted and early intervention on the part of the sheriff. That Ms. was Van, all before the law. Ms. Van Brook, Carol, is that I actually how it have a, Carol, can I say, there's a quote from the sheriff's own compliance report saying, the sheriff began complying with this order on April 11th by providing all quarantine detainees one surgical mask per day. That is in the sheriff's own report. The court ordered it on April 9th, and by the 11th, detainees got masks. That is, is a it, fact in the record. We have about 10 seconds. It is a fact also that this continues in court. Is that correct from both correct. of you? Correct, correct. Mr. Shannon? That is correct, and most recently, the appellate court rejected uh, the entry of the district court's order focused on social distancing, which represents the core of plaintiff's current complaint. That but, none, but nonetheless, it does, con it does continue in court, correct? It does. it does. For both of you. Then we will continue this discussion, we hope, at a later time. Alexa Van Brunt and Robert Shannon, we're grateful that you could take some time to talk to us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. And now, Brandis, we go back to you. Carol, thank you. Still to come on Chicago Tonight. Some aldermen are planting the seeds to keep Chicago's trees evergreen. An exhibit on the life and legal work of Ruth Bader Ginsburg with family stories from her son. There are too many damn guns on our streets. And, and our Spotlight Politics team takes a look at what the mayor and federal government are doing to address Chicago's pervasive violence. But first. Earlier in the program, we spoke with some aldermen about the city's policing strategy and federal agents coming to Chicago. They join us again now, this time to focus on some of the ways the city is addressing the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Once again, our city council members, Harry Osterman, Gilbert Viegas, Maria Haddon, and Matt Martin, thanks to all of you for sticking around. Um, so the city council, today you all passed an ordinance that would give long-term renters up to four months notice of eviction, but some aldermen expressed fear that that some homeowners and landlords might be forced into foreclosure by this measure. Uh, Alderman Osterman, how do you address those concerns? I think today was a very important uh, ordinance for tenants uh, that gives them more notice about when their leases will be not be renewed um, or when they're going to get a rent increase. And I think that gives families the ability to find new housing. Housing stability is a critical component right now with, with the pandemic that we're dealing with. And I think the ordinance today, which was supported by my colleagues on the show tonight, was a really positive step in the right direction. Uh, we are working to get federal and state money to help uh, provide rental uh, subsidies. But I think today provides some stability for tenants that need it very much. Uh, the city council also passed a new ordinance to prevent cars uh, from being impounded for non-driving offenses. Alderman Viegas, why was this such a priority for the city council right now? Well, it's this just falls in line with the, the fines and fees uh, ordinances that were passed uh, early in the administration. Um, Cook County uh, led the nation in, 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 for, in uh, bankruptcies due to fines and fees. And so this is just along the lines of correcting this, this practice of, of, uh, of uh, predatory towing. Uh, and this is just the beginning because there's some other towing ordinances and hearings that are gonna take place uh, especially around the, the the tow truck companies that that are chasing accidents uh, and gouging uh, consumers. 
Alderman Martin, uh, you know, starting this Friday, the city is going to be rolling back some of the phase four reopenings, uh, relaxing or tightening rules that had been relaxed around drinking in bars, some indoor dining, gyms and personal services. Do you support that move? I do. We um, are trying to be as data driven as possible when it comes to managing this crisis, and we've done a much better job than many other cities, but we can't take that good work for granted. We've seen an uptick, in particular, our rolling seven day average. It was uh, above 5%, which was the threshold that we need to be beneath in order to be in phase four. So I think it's absolutely appropriate to roll back those things, but make sure in doing so that we don't lose sight of the fact that a lot of our restaurants, a lot of our businesses will continue to struggle and some a little bit more so as a result of this. So it's really imperative that we have federal assistance, pa assistance passed for our small businesses, as well as those employees to help them, uh, to help them through these incredibly troubling times. Now on schools reopening, uh, we spoke with one parent. She is a teacher at a CPS charter school in addition to being a mother of four. Um, and she told us uh, how she feels about the prospect of her children returning to school in the fall. As a parent, my number one concern is why we are reopening. We closed in March to avoid the spread of COVID. And now after 130,000 people have died and the cases are going up, why would, now, why would it be safe now to open schools? when it was dangerous enough at lower numbers to close schools. A lot of people are even suggesting national teacher strikes. Now, uh, the Chicago Teachers Union has been vocal about opposing a return to school. Alderwoman Haddon, do you have faith in the plan uh, that we've heard so far from CPS uh, that schools can reopen safely? I have heard from many of my residents and uh, constituents, folks in the area, that, that they don't have faith in this plan. I certainly have my own questions. I was pleased to see us come out sooner than the end of August with a starting point from which people could have conversations. And also, we've got to do a better job and CPS needs to do a better job of really being inclusive in the decision-making processes. I know some concerns where we were putting out surveys from them to collect more information from residents um, at when they had already made the decision. So based on the feedback that I'm getting, hearing from the teachers, hearing from the other staff, there are so many concerns. I think we should really be focusing on what it looks like to have fair, equitable, remote online options and to move forward in, in that way. What happens if teachers refuse to return to the classroom because they don't feel safe? We're not gonna be able to function, right? And so we need to include people who are most impacted. So the students, their families, the teachers and the staff. And I hope that CPS um, holds through on, on what they say uh, they will do, which is to include these voices in making any final decisions. Um, Alderman Martin, according to data released yesterday by Yelp, some 4,400 area businesses have been forced to close due to the pandemic. More than half of them, 2,400, will not be reopening. What more can the city do to, to help businesses uh, survive this pandemic? And I apologize, we've got about 40 seconds left. Absolutely. So I think we need to continue to find ways to expedite the permitting process. So if someone says we want to have an outdoor space as a restaurant, um, we want to utilize that um, to work through that permitting process quickly. We still have modest resources at our disposal um, to continue to hand out um, to restaurants and businesses. But we're, we're struggling to meet that demand. And we know that without a real effective partnership at other levels of government, we're gonna to continue to struggle, especially once we get into the budget season and see what the effects of COVID have been on our revenues, sales tax, amusement tax and the like. So um, there's certainly more things that we need to do, but um, to get more help from the federal government would uh, is, is really what we need to be focused on at this point. Okay, we'll have to leave it there. My thanks to Alderman Matt Martin, Harry Osterman, uh, Gilbert Villegas and Maria Haddon. Thanks to you all for joining us. Thank you. Up next, we dig into another measure introduced to City Council, this one on the growing concern over Chicago's trees. But first, a look at the weather. Adding to the busy day at City Hall was a measure calling for a new Urban Forest Advisory Board brought forth by a trio of aldermen. One of those aldermen says even though Chicago's motto is herbs in horto or city in a garden, 
Chicago doesn't really reach to that height. Joining us with more details is WTTW news reporter Patty Wetley. And Patty, who's behind this initiative and why do they think it's necessary to form an advisory board? So the lead sponsor of this ordinance is Alderman Scott Wagesback in the 32nd sport. 32nd Ward, and he has um, Alderman Cardenas and Alderman Nugent on as co-sponsors. And the thinking behind this is that um, Chicago's tree canopy or urban forest actually should be thought of um, as just an important piece of infrastructure as roads and sewers. But if you think of how it's treated, um, an inspector general report found in 2019 that 75% of the activity of the city's forestry bureau is actually just responding to 311 requests for tree trimming. And so an urban forestry advisory board would bring together people from all the various city departments that have anything to do with trees, from the park district to the water department to streets and sand. And, and, and some, Patty, before I let you go, like what do some of yeah. the local conservation organizations say about this measure and this idea? Oh, they're super excited because it means healthier trees. It means no longer being reactive in how we care for the city's trees and how we plant them, but being far more strategic and looking at the trees as a resource and not just, you know, that thing that's planted in the parkway that occasionally limbs fall off of. Got to take care of those trees. Patty Wetley, thanks yes. so much for joining us. <laughs> thanks, Brandis. And you can read Patty's full story on our website. That's WTTW.com slash news. When she was nominated to the Supreme Court in 1993, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was confirmed by a 96 to 3 vote. Originally seen as a moderate, she became good friends with the conservative Justice Antonin Scalia. Years later, she wrote a series of fiery dissents that sealed her notoriety. She's recently been in the news because of recurrence of cancer, but vows to keep working. In February, before the pandemic set in, a local museum curated a show on the notorious RBG, and we toured with a Chicago man who just happens to be her son. Here's another look. There are surprising photos, robes to try on, even tchotchkes in the gift shop. It all emerged from a fan-based blog and subsequent book. We are here at Notorious RBG, The Life and Times of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. It's an exhibition based off of a book of the same name that was published in 2015. Our museum looks at the history of the Holocaust and larger historical messages about social justice. We want to move visitors from history into action. And there's no better person to look at who's committed her entire life to social justice than uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And there are home movies of the justice and her late husband, Martin Ginsburg, and courtroom sketches, and yearbook photos of the young woman born Joan Ruth Bader. There are also a wide variety of objects that are on loan from the justice herself, from the Supreme Court, and from even the Smithsonian. We toured the exhibit with her son, who dropped out of the University of Chicago Law School to start Sadie Records, the Chicago classical music label. We asked him about life at home. I didn't know it was too different from other households uh, at the time, uh, growing up in the 70s with two working parents, I mean, two pretty high-powered working parents, but, you know, uh, dinner time was family time, and they were still there to make sure I did my homework and, uh, and the rest, so it, it felt normal to me. Music was always playing in the household, uh, and that was something that obviously I uh, glommed onto at a young age. My parents had the classic recordings of the era, like the uh, Toscanini Beethoven symphonies. Uh, by the time I was seven, I was starting to collect my own recordings. Not all my classmates' mothers worked, so I knew that was a little bit different. Uh, but it was, it was very much more different for my sister, who's 10 years older than me. I like to tell the story of when she was on a play date. She was five or six and overheard her friend's mother say, be nice to Jane, her mommy works and work she did. She started the Women's Rights Project at the ACLU at the beginning of the 70s. Uh, 
She had been teaching at Rutgers, and then she became the first tenured woman professor at Columbia, and then in 1980 was appointed to the appeals court in Washington. Now in her 27th year on the Supreme Court, RBG has a touring museum exhibit that aims to please both fans and legal scholars. There's a quote in the exhibition itself that she has tried in her life to take the skills and abilities that she had and put them with very hard work and effort into the things that she found the most important and that was really to work for gender equality and to fight injustice in her work and I think she would encourage us all to do the same. The show is called The Notorious RBG, The Life and Times of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. It's at the newly reopened Illinois Holocaust Museum in Skokie, and it has been extended into January. The museum, of course, has new safety precautions, and they ask that you reserve tickets in advance. There's more on our website, including a link to the original blog that inspired the exhibit and her son's story about his mother reading legal briefs while on golf outings with the family. Chicago's violence takes the national spotlight today. Our spotlight politics team of Carol Marine, Heather Sharon, and Amanda Vinicky are here to take a closer look at that and more. Welcome back, everybody. So let's start with President Trump confirming what Mayor Lori Lightfoot revealed yesterday that his administration was not deploying 150 paramilitary federal agents here. Here's what the president and the mayor said today. The FBI. ATF, DEA, U.S. Marshal Service, and Homeland Security will together be sending hundreds of skilled law enforcement officers to Chicago. If those agents are here to actually work in partnership on support of uh, gun violence and violent cases, plugging into existing infrastructure of federal agents, not trying to play police in our streets, then that's something different, and that may add value. But the proof is going to be in the pudding. Heather Sharon, let's start with you. How will this approach help? Well, 150 agents are on their way, as best we can tell, to help enforce federal law in Chicago. Now, this is a strategy that has been used by the Trump administration in 2017. And, and even with pres under President Obama, when Chicago saw its crime surge, federal agents came to help. However, it, you know, Mayor Lightfoot didn't sound totally convinced that the Trump would keep his word on this. And she asked people to call her office, to call 911, to call their aldermen if they saw Homeland Security agents that they thought were doing things that they shouldn't be doing. So it, it's a very fraught situation, even though this is a, a tried and true approach to a surge in, in violence, which of course we are experiencing here in Chicago. Carol Marine, talk about those past surges in federal agents and how or did it help to curb gang violence? You know, for a time, it may have been a sort of a way to ameliorate it. I've seen a lot of strike forces. I've seen a lot of pairings between ATF and DEA and CPD, and these things come and then they go. So one of the questions to ask here is how long do we expect this kind of federal aid to persist and how fully integrated will it be and will it be focused for instance on tracking guns and and the kinds of guns that are crossing our border but the truth of it is and you heard it from father michael plager we are not going to out police this problem it has to be holistically dealt with and that's more than law enforcement there has to be a way that this isn't a tale of two cities where you have areas where they swat in and then other parts of the city that aren't feeling the same kinds of pressures or lack of employment or lack of education or housing insecurity. This is a holistic problem that requires a holistic solution. Um, Amanda, Governor Pritzker said today that his phone call to the Department of Homeland Security was not returned or has not been returned at last we heard. But Mayor Lightfoot said that her letter to the president was uh, responded to. The president called later this afternoon. Um, they had a brief phone call. Amanda, wish you could have been a fly on the wall for that one. 
better believe it, or at least, I don't know, have some sort of, there's a lot of wiretapping going on in Chicago these days, <laughs> right? So um, not making any allegations there, merely saying that I would love to hear a whole lot of tapes these days, including, of course, this one, although the call from what we were told very briefly by Mayor Lori Lightfoot's office was short it was direct. She says she did relay to him that she expects really these officers to be on their best behavior and to do as the president has promised in terms of trying to hinder any further gun violence, go after traffickers of guns, of drugs, and not get into any of those other areas where, of course, there is a whole lot of suspicion, particularly right now, given the president's remarks, not just about Chicago, but about uh, immigration who are undocumented. There, there's a whole lot of concern about any sort of interaction with officials from the Trump administration at this point. So as we've been discussing um, over the course of this show, as Amanda reported earlier, obviously 15 people were shot Tuesday outside a funeral in Auburn Gresham. Here's what the mayor said about that today. I recognize that there is fear. And we understand that. But if we are silent, the violence will continue. Uh, now, the mayor saying, you know, she wants people to come forward if they know something. Carol, people have been afraid to come forward for fear of retribution. Uh, how do you how do you break that cycle? Is it a matter of witness protection? Witness protection isn't going to going to fly on this one. First of all, you have to subsidize it. Secondly, the witnesses have got to trust that they will be protected, that they won't be revealed. There isn't sufficient trust in in plenty of parts of Chicago for that to actually work. There needs to be a kind of bridge building in communities with other communities. So this city sees itself as a whole city, not just as a piece of splintered parts. And so um, trust is a, is a rare and important commodity and you don't build it in a day and you don't build it in a few months of a SWAT team coming in. Now, also with regard to COVID-19 restrictions, there were just under 1,600 new COVID-19 cases today uh, or announced today. Governor Pritzker says the state is perilously close to implementing restrictions. Here's what he said. The states like Arizona and Florida that are in full-blown crisis right now, it started with a gradual rise in the numbers. You can go from 3% positivity to Arizona's 23% positivity in the blink of an eye. Now, uh, you know, restrictions are back for some bars. 18 states are now on the list of uh, quarantine uh, states, if you should be coming to Chicago uh, from those states. Carol, what's happening here? Are people, um, are they getting coronavirus fatigue and tired of quarantining and mask wearing? I think there is some of that. Um, I think the governor is making a really important point that we can step on the accelerator here in just a second and be back where we we were. And, and I don't have much doubt um, that Lightfoot and Pritzker would reinstitute some lockdown if they felt they needed it. And there is denial. I can go into a grocery store. Plenty of people are wearing masks, but there are certainly some people who look affronted by the idea that, that some of us are wearing them. So um, this is not a place where we're all singing from the same songbook, even now that we know how desperately serious this is. Now, CTU Vice President Stacey Davis Gates, you know, she talked about bars being open uh, at a press conference before the Chicago Board of Education meeting uh, today. Let's hear what she said. Make it make sense, CPS. Make it make sense, Mayor Lightfoot, because I can't explain why shutting down a bar and opening up a school makes sense to me. Now, Heather, the board discussed having juniors and seniors fully remote in the fall. I think there's been some pushback against that. Um, what, what, will there be any changes to the plan, Heather? Well, I think this is a plan that's very much in flux because it depends on what that positivity rate and how many cases Chicago has as we approach the start of school, which is, of course, after Labor Day. But I think the question really becomes is that to open schools, 
other things are going to have to potentially be scaled back. And I think we've seen the start of that with the restrictions on the bars and some personal services like beard trimming and facials that are going to go into effect on Friday. Now, if you if we don't see a drop in the number of cases after those restrictions are implemented, and, and especially if we see continued increases, I, I would think that additional restrictions, especially on indoor dining, are probably the next trigger that that the mayor and the governor are going to look for because they they both want to see that sort of hybrid school model at least tried at the beginning as long as illinois and chicago doesn't return to as we heard the governor say a full-blown crisis and, and brandis if speaking of bars as i drive through the city of chicago and especially on the north side where there are an awful lot of young people they're not getting that message in those bars and you can see them you know at night they are cheek by jowl many of them <laughs> and this is really a place that is a problem and we'll have to leave it there thanks to our spotlight politics team carol marine heather sharon and amanda vinicky and for more on president trump's comments on sending federal agents to chicago you can visit our website that's wttw.com news and that's our show for this Wednesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Amanda Vinicky visits Gage Park as part of our In Your Neighborhood series. And a local recording artist takes a musical tour of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for watching. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that is proud of its partners named Illinois Leading Lawyers by the Law Bulletin Publishing Company of Chicago.